Jesus has arrived at Jerusalem for this Passover, this fateful Passover. Um, the people have hailed him as the Messiah. It's the triumphal entry. They've laid down the palm branches. They said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Save now. Zechariah wrote specifically about how the Messiah would come to Jerusalem, what it would look like. Zechariah 9.9, it says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and bringing salvation lowly, riding upon an ass, the colt, the foal of an ass. So Jesus has, has come in exactly as Zechariah had predicted. Um, he's fulfilling prophecy left and right. He tells the guys, look, you're going to go into the city. He, he's, he's claiming messiahship, and he's, he's actually allowing himself to be worshipped. His hour has come. And he says, guys, you're going to go into the city. You're going to see a donkey tied up. And he tells them how to get the donkey, what's going to happen when they get there, where it is. The guy's going to say, uh, what are you doing? And, and you're going to say, the master has need, and he's, you're going to, he's going to let him go. So Jesus has all these things. The timing is impeccable. What's going on? All these prophecies are being fulfilled. Jesus is fulfilling them to the day, to the exact moment. Uh, it, it's incredible, the, the, the timing um, and the, uh, the prophetic fulfillment that Jesus is, is doing at this time. The people rejoice. There's two to three million people. The city is, is, is loud. It's raucous. Um, the, the city swells to about that many people. 600,000 normally, the population is, is two to three million. So the religious leaders, you'd think they would recognize this prophecy when it's happening. It's Zechariah 9.9. Jesus is coming in a donkey. It looks, it sounds, it looks a lot like that. Jesus rides in on the exact day that Daniel prophesied in Daniel, the 70 weeks prophecy, 173,880 days from the time Artaxerxes Longimanus gave the decree to rebuild the walls and Nehemiah went back and rebuilt those walls, 173,880 days to the day Jesus rides in. They should have known. And that's why Jesus wept over the city. He said, if you had only known this in this thy day, the things that belong to your peace, but they're hid from you, you can't see them. They had a lack of prophetic understanding. They looked at the scriptures all day long, but they didn't, they didn't see Jesus in them. They didn't see the Messiah. They didn't see the plan of the ages unfolding right in front of their eyes. They're so consumed with their religious institution. And Jesus makes a beeline straight for the temple, and he looks round about says in verse 11, on all things, when he looked round about on all things, it was eventide when he was come, and he went out unto Bethany with the twelve. It's at this point that Jesus is going to give his verdict on what he thinks of first century Judaism, what he thinks of what he's given his people, the Jewish nation. They were to be a light that shines to the world. What he thinks they've done with the gifts that he's given them, what it had become. Judaism had become a dead religious system. Now, as we go forward, you might tend to look at religious Israel as a bunch of like, I, I look at them with a little disdain. I get angry how they treat Jesus. I don't like how they're treating their Messiah. I don't like how the religious leaders are behaving. I don't like how blind they are to their own prophecies. They think they know the scriptures and they're not seeing anything of Jesus in them. So I get angry at the religious leaders as I watch what they do to Jesus. Jesus has done only good to them, healed people. This is what their dead religion has produced so dead that they can't even recognize their Messiah when he rolls up into Jerusalem, what was prophesied. Now, before we get too angry at them, Jesus warns the church that we could have the same attitude. We could miss the day. We can miss prophecy because we're so consumed with prosperity teaching or what the world gives us or consumer Christianity that we lack the prophetic death or we lack the prophetic understanding of the word of God to understand the times and the seasons that we live in and where we're at on the timeline of eternity and how close Jesus is the coming. Jesus says this to the church of Sardis in Revelation 3. Beware of having that same attitude. I see a parallel between first century Judaism and 21st century Christianity that is, is scary and eerily similar. We think we have a name, we have a church, we have buildings, but do we really have Jesus? Revelation 3, 1 says, and unto the angel, this is Jesus speaking, so um, I didn't write this, Jesus said this, this is an epistle from Jesus, so you want to listen to what he has to say. 
Unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works. You have a name that you live and you're dead. Wake up, be watchful, strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, which are already in the process of dying. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and heard. Go back to the beginning. Hold fast, repent, change your mind. If you therefore shall not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and you shall not know what hour I will come upon thee. He's going to come upon the church of Sardis in a similar way that he came upon the Jews in the first century. With an attitude of we're alive, we have everything we need, but they're dead and they don't even know it. They don't even know how close to judgment they are. He says, I'm coming like a thief to that church. They won't know the day either. Just as the Jewish, Jewish people and the religious leaders didn't know the day they were in, much of the church and much of people in Christianity don't know the day that they live in. And Jesus says, if you don't know, I'm going to come on you like a thief, and you're not going to be ready. Luke 21, 34 says, take heed to yourselves, Jesus speaking, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with surfeiting. That's not surfing. That's um, riotous living, carnal living, and drunkenness, and the cares of this life, living for this world, consumed with the things of this present age. And so that day come upon you unaware. You're not ready. So we have a date with destiny much like they did. So before we denigrate them, let's be ready for the day that's approaching, fastly approaching upon us. And let's pray always that we may be accounted worthy to escape all these things and stand before the Son of Man. It's very easy to become ignorant when you're a part of a dead religious system. It's very easy to become, to have a Bible and not have the God of the Bible. To have a religion and not a relationship. That's exactly what they had in the first century. And I see an eerie, eerie similarity to it. Jesus looking round about on all things. And on the morrow, verse 12, when they were come from Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus had the same um, difficulties we have. Hungry, tired, tempted, the Bible says, in all points like we are, yet he was without sin. And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves. So he sees this fig tree, it's far off, and it's fully bloomed. It has all these leaves. He came, if happily, he's searching through it, if he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto him, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. And his disciples heard it. So Jesus is looking, he sees this fig tree, he's looking for fruit. The tree had leaves. It's guilty of false advertising. It, 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 it looks like it's got something. It seems like it has something. And he's searching through it, and he can't find any fruit in it. So the leaves said that there are figs, but the actual reality is there was no fruit. There's no fruit upon inspection. Now, this is the only destructive miracle that Jesus does in the Gospels. Everywhere else, he's healing, fixing, binding. He's doing He's doing good things. This is the only time Jesus ever destroys anything with a miracle. So I think it's important that we take note to what the miracle is. The miracle is a parable. He's just looked round about on the nation, uh, on the temple. He's going to cleanse it here in a minute. The nation of Israel at this time, they had a temple. They had the word of God. They had the priesthood. They had everything they needed to, to produce some fruit that would change people's lives. That when people came to church, they would actually meet God there. That the Israelites would be a representative of Yahweh God to all the other nations round about. And they would come and they would understand what sacrifice means at the temple. They would understand that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. They would understand what God was doing. They would understand about that Passover and who the Passover lamb really was. That was really their job. So they have this big structure and institution, but there's no fruit in it. In the Old Testament, Israel is alluded to as a fig tree many times. Jeremiah 24, Nahum 3.12, Zechariah 3.10, Joel 1.7. You can go through. I'll read Hosea 9, chapter 9, verse 10, so you can get the flavor of it. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your fathers as the first ripe in the fig tree at her first time. But they went to Baal Peor and separated themselves under that shame. Jesus would say, when you see the fig tree blooming, know that the time is near, alluding to Israel once again. So Jesus sees this fig tree in all its potential, and he looks for fruit and is not finding any. It's a picture of the nation of Israel. All leaves, but nothing real. 
So he curses that tree and he says, let no man eat fruit of thee hereafter forever. In Matthew 21, Jesus tells the leaders, therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God, what you were given by God. See, the Jewish people were given the oracles of God. They wrote the scripture. All the Bible was written by Jews. It was handed to them except for Luke and Acts. That was written by Luke. Every book in the Bible was written by a Jew. The early church was filled with Jews. Um, Jesus Christ is Jewish. He's the Jewish Messiah. God's not done with the Jewish nation. But because he went there and they rejected him, he was looking for fruit. He came unto his own. His own didn't receive him, but to as many as he received him, to them he gave the power to become what? The sons and daughters of the Most High God. Because you didn't do anything with what I gave you, I'm going to take what I gave you and I'm going to give it to a nation that's going to bring forth the fruit. Because God's looking for fruit. See, God wants a return on his investment. God doesn't give us any spiritual blessings without expecting something in return. Got a question for you. If you're investing in anything, how long before you pull the plug if you're not getting anything back in return? Well, God's very patient with his investment. He's waited thousands of years. So a larger principle is in play. Jesus is looking for fruit. He knows what real fruit is and what's phony. The people of God are known by what? By their fruit, you're going to know them. You're going to look at a Christian and you're going to know by what they, how they live, where, what they love, what they be, what they, what, what's most important to them by their fruit, the passion of their life, what produces out, out of their life. You're going to know that, that they belong to me. By their fruit, you're going to know who, who belongs to who. And Jesus wants a return. He's looking at Israel. He's not getting one. God did not save us as the church of Jesus Christ to look good, to write books, to build big cathedrals. He saved us to produce eternal fruit. We're not building an earthly institution. Christ is building a heavenly kingdom. He says, lo, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, you can be with me. Where is that place? It's not on this earth. My kingdom is not of this world. We are going to come back to this earth and we're going to rule and reign with Jesus. But make no mistake, his kingdom is an eternal kingdom. The new Jerusalem is coming down out of heaven, built by God for us. That's our destiny. That's our home. That's where he wants fruit. I don't really think Jesus cares how big this building is. He cares how many people are saved inside this building that are going to live eternally with him in heaven. That's the fruit that he's looking for. That's what he wants from his people. Jesus is not into phony religion. He's into a real relationship. He's into sons and daughters. There's no grandchildren in the kingdom of God. You're direct born by the spirit of God into his kingdom. And that produces eternal offspring, not temporary offspring. These flesh, these bodies are going to die. But if you're born again by the spirit of God, you're going to live forever with them. The problem with Israel is that they had an outward appearance of life, but no real faith. In fact, Jesus would say, look, guys, you cross the oceans to make one proselyte to get them a card-carrying member of your church and make them pay tithe. And when you cross the oceans to make one proselyte, you make them twice the child of hell because they believe they're going to heaven and they're really going to hell. You confirm them to hell. And how many churches can do that? Listen, you don't join a church to get saved you join Jesus Christ. You ask him to save you and you become a member of the body of Christ. There's no boundary to that. There's nobody that has a corner on that market. There's all kinds of people in the body of Christ. Every tribe, nation, kindred, and tongue. You don't go to a seminary to get saved. You don't even have to go to church. You got to go to Jesus Christ to get saved because he's the Savior. They were so blind at this time, they couldn't recognize their own Messiah. They had a name that they were alive, but they were dead. They had big buildings. They had all these things. You could spend your whole day looking through leaves and not finding anything spiritual. And I'm, I'm afraid much of what goes on on Sunday morning, sometimes in the Western church, is looking through a bunch of leaves and not finding anything real. If you come here and you don't meet Jesus Christ or he doesn't speak to your heart, he's in the midst of his church, in the midst of the candlestick, he's walking around in this room, he wants to speak to you directly. He wants to talk to you. He loves you. He wants sons and he wants daughters. They had nothing real. 
all leaves, all show and no go, all promise but no performance. Verse 15, and they come to Jerusalem and Jesus went into the temple. Out them that sold and bought in the temple overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. Now, if you're poor, you bought a dove. And he would not suffer that any man should carry any vessel through the temple. And he taught, saying unto them, Is it not written, My house? I like when Jesus says, My house. Welcome to my house. He's in control. Shall be called of all nations the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. So he calls the temple his house. It's his temple. It's the city of the king. In fact, Jerusalem belongs to Jesus. Jesus will come back and he will rule and reign. Lift ye up, ye everlasting gates. Lift ye up, ye everlasting doors. The king of glory may come in. Prophecy states Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years from Jerusalem. It's his city, his temple. And you've turned my house into a den of thieves. Now, the temple at this time was a huge complex. About 35 acres still is. Mount Moriah over there is fought over. It's a cup of trembling to all the nations today. And the court of the Gentiles was a large area, the outer portion, paved with marble, the largest area of all. Gentiles, it was the only place the Gentiles could go and could pray. And in the middle, uh, acres it was, three acres, easy. And in, in the middle of that, the court of the women was about another six feet up, and they had uh, openings in it with a big wall about this high. And if you were a Gentile, it said, if you go past this point, you'll be dead. You cannot go into the court of the women if you're a Gentile and your death is on your own head if you went past that point. And then from the court of the women was the court of the men. Jewish men could go there. And then was the temple proper where the priest would officiate. So the only place a Gentile could pray was in this area, this area of the court of the Gentiles. This is where they set up shop, the money changers. They sold their doves, they sold their lambs, and they had to exchange your money there. So the only place a Gentile could go and pray and offer his sacrifice or worship God, a once-in-a-lifetime trip, he would go there and they would arrive at like a concession stand at a stadium, okay? Now, anybody been to a concession stand at a stadium? How do you like their prices on soda or beer? Don't buy the beer, but you know what I mean. Expensive, right? So what do you do? You go across the street to the 7-Eleven and you hide it all in your pockets and hope they don't search you. And go in there and take a 32 ounce for like two bucks instead of 15. Well, that's how it was there. They would come and get ripped off. The temple was a closed city, much like the Vatican is today. They had their own guards. They had their own um, money. You couldn't use outside money because if you brought in Roman money, it had the picture of a man on it. That was idolatry. You weren't allowed to have it. Interestingly enough, you could bring it to the court of the Gentiles because they took your money. They took your foreign money, and then you had to exchange it for the temple's shekel, and they would get you 10 to 1, so they would rob all your money that way. Then if you wanted to buy a lamb, say, outside in the street, and you would bring one, it would be spotless. They would come there. They would find something wrong with it because you couldn't bring any lamb. You had to buy their kosher inspected lamb. And that cost 10 times what you would buy down the road. So they got you coming, and they got you going. And they did this all in the court of the Gentiles. All of this went on where the Gentile was supposed to worship, where you were supposed to come and give your offering to God. They called it the Bazaar of Annas. Annas and his sons ran it, and they made lots of money. According to some people I've heard and read, Caiaphas didn't even do anything, but his cut was $3 million for Passover. His cut. And he was a high priest. That, that for doing nothing. That's what he got paid. So you can imagine what Annas and his sons made. They made money hand over fist. The priests were involved in it. Everybody was involved with it. So when a sincere worshiper comes to God, see, the only thing going back then, the church didn't exist, was the Jewish religion because it came from God. The Jews received knowledge from the Lord. He came to Mount Sinai, gave them the law, gave them the Torah. They're the only ones that have, have anything that was real. All the other religions were phony. So when you came there to meet the true and the living God, you got ripped off by religious thieves. Imagine turning church into a business. It doesn't happen today, but back then it was horrible. <laughs> Taking advantage of God's people for money. A focus on money. 
their own prosperity instead of prayer, salvation, and meeting God. Jesus comes in and he flips everything over because the temple belongs to me. It's my house. And you've made it a den of thieves. This doesn't belong to you. Ministry does not belong. Real ministry does not belong to any man. It belongs to God because we have this ministry. The Bible says it was given to us by the apostles, by God, directly to us. We have this ministry and you have this ministry as well. The Bible says you're an able minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You were handed that ministry by God. It doesn't belong to you. If you have your own ministry, I can guarantee you it doesn't come from God. There's no such thing as your ministry. It's God's ministry. It's the oracles of God. God was handed to us by God. Now, when he kicks them out, you got to realize, this is about four acres. If I went on Monday morning, if I went to Wall Street, and I said, I'm shutting this down, this is my house, what would happen to me? They'd carry me out leg by leg, and you'd laugh at me and say, that's a crazy pastor. He's an idiot. I ain't going back to that church anymore. As um, They're laughing at me as they're carrying me out. Well, when Jesus went to his house, he had such physical, mental, and spiritual power. When he walked in there, everybody stood down. Business stopped. That's how powerful he was. That's how strong he was. People look at Jesus as weak. He, he, trust me, Jesus, with all the power of heaven, was behind him. And when he said, get out, they ran. Just by his look. Just by who he was and is. That's a miracle right there. He cleansed acres of area single-handedly and wouldn't let anybody back up. What will Jesus do when he shows up to judge his church? What would Jesus do if he walked in to many places this morning? I would get a kick out of it. Like some of these people here are probably watching Jesus. They got front row seats. This is great. Nobody's ever treated the Pharisees like this before. Well, what do you do if he went to the Vatican? I'd want a front row seat to that. Get my popcorn ready. Jesus is going to rough up some priests. What's he going to do to the guy with the big hat and the crooked scepter? How many institutions would he overturn? How many seminaries would he walk into and throw up? He says, you make me want to vomit in, 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 in Revelation. How many, how many tables would he turn over? How many false religious systems that claim the name of Christ don't even know the word of God, don't have any clue about the prophetic timeline that they're on? Sitting here preaching prosperity when the world is burning and Jesus Christ is about ready to return. A great lesson. You know, how many people went to that early temple and went home feeling ripped off and never found God because of the way that they misrepresented God? At church, How many people have gone to churches today and they've gone into a church and it was so, so much focused on money and prosperity that they left feeling ripped off? They got a thermometer up there always asking me for money and you never learn nothing about God. And you never go home loving God more. And this is a great lesson. Jesus is tough. Jesus tells the truth. He tells the truth about what he sees and what he thinks. And that you should be glad for because a lot of people these days don't tell the truth. We live, in a play, we live in a culture that has no truth. There is no truth. Truth is my feelings or my emotions. There's no variable. You can't even say a man's a man or a woman's a woman because I don't feel that way. Call me something else. I can prove you're a man or a woman. That don't matter. That's not my truth. What happens when your truth and my truth collide? We need a real truth that we can count on, and Jesus Christ always told the truth because the truth makes you free. See, this emotions and feelings, that enslaves you, and that's what they're doing to the world today. They're enslaving you because you don't know what truth is. Truth is, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but through him, and he always tells the truth because he loves you. I'm glad he does. And if you're a believer and Jesus Christ has moved into your life, guess what can happen? He can walk into your temple because you're the temple, the Bible says, of the living God. He lives inside of you. He can flip over whatever tables he likes because he owns you. And I pray that he does. He comes into my life quite frequently and flips over a lot of tables. And I think he should do that because you're his temple. Did you know that? Your life is not your own. You belong to Christ. You were bought with a price. You belong to him just like this temple did. So don't ever think that you're, you, 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 you're your own person. And I love people that say, well, you know what? Nobody tells me what to do. Oh, yeah, you're serving somebody. You're either serving the Lord or you're serving Satan. You don't serve yourself. You're serving to somebody. So he 
goes in there, flips everything over. They're not very happy. They're losing millions of dollars. Everybody's cut is going down. And the scribes and the chief priests heard it and sought how they might destroy him. They want to kill the Messiah. For they feared him because all the people were astonished at his doctrine. They're astonished at the way he teaches. And when even was come, he went out of the city. So they want to destroy the Messiah because they feared him. He's striking a chord with all the people. The people know truth. They understand he's speaking the truth, and they're amazed at his doctrine, his teaching. The Bible says that he taught with authority and not like one of the scribes or the Pharisees because when they taught you, they quoted another man or they quoted a commentary. When Jesus taught, he said stuff like this. You've heard it said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. I say unto you that if you've looked on a woman with lust, you've already committed adultery. And they're like, hmm. And when Jesus said it, he said it with such authority because he wrote the scripture that it, it, it rang true. The people are hanging on his every word. He's zealous for his house. No one can stop him. And all the attention's on Jesus, and they're afraid because they're being exposed. Nobody likes to be exposed, especially a religious hypocrite or phony. They hate being called out. They want to kill you if you call them out on anything. So they're losing their grip, their control, their power, and they don't like it. So they want to kill God's voice, and that's what people do today. They want to shut up Christianity. They want to shut up truth. They want to shut up the name of Jesus. You can speak about anything you want. Just don't speak about Jesus. Well, let me tell you something. You can silence all the voices you want, but you can't stop the gospel. And you gates of hell will not prevail against the true church of Jesus Christ. It's not going to happen. Psalm 2 is a great psalm. It says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? They take counsel against the Lord and his anointed saying, we don't want him to rule over us. Let us break his bands from us. I hate being attached to God. Let us cast his course from us. We're going to do it our way. Guess what God does? He sits in the heavens and he laughs. It, he's, it's a derision laugh. It's like, <laughs> silly. Silly rabbit, yeah, dummy. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen because this is his creation. It's a vanity. They're astonished at his doctrine. And when even has come, Jesus went out of the city. So the scribes, they want to kill Jesus. They fear him. He's striking a chord with the people. Verse 20, in the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Peter's like, wow, that was fast. I guess when Jesus moves on, he moves on pretty quickly when he makes up his mind, huh? And Peter, calling to remembrance, saith unto him, Master, Jesus, behold, the fig tree which thou cursed is withered away. It's dried up by the roots. That was fast. So fruitlessness always results in death. The nation itself doesn't even realize that it's only 40 years away from destruction, 40 years from the moment. See, the disciples, they're going to hear Jesus speak all these things, and they're going to say, Jesus, and... and Mark chapter 13, the Olivet Discourse, when we get there, great, great passage. They're going to say, Jesus, look at these buildings. Look at this temple. Nothing can move this stuff. Look at these things. They're permanent. And Jesus is going to say, you see all that? Not one stone is going to be on top of another. That's not going to be thrown down. Forty years later, it happened just like that. It's not permanent. If you have no fruit, it's not permanent. They had no clue how fast Jerusalem would be withered away and scattered that beautiful temple would be destroyed and that religious system would be gone in a moment. 70 AD all the way to 1948 until the birth of the nation of Israel once again. And now we have a big problem with the Temple Mount once again. Jesus is coming soon. You can see it. This is a vivid reminder that Jesus wants fruit. 1 Corinthians 3.9, the Bible says that we are God's husbandry. That means we're his cultivated field. That when he looks at us, he looks at us and he wants to see fruit produced. Jesus gave this parable, and I like to read it whenever I'm here because I think it's important. He says this in Luke chapter 13, verse 6. He also spake this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard. And he came and he looked for fruit there, and he didn't find any. He said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come, I look for fruit on this fig tree. I'm not finding any. Cut it down. It clutters up. Cumberth means it's cluttering up my ground. 
I never want to clutter up God's ground. And he answered and said unto them, Lord, let it alone this year, the, the, the faithfulness of God and the Lord to, to, to give us more opportunity till I shall dig about it and fertilize it. And if it bear fruit, good. And if not, down. So the Bible says a tree is known by its fruit. We're his people. We're his cultivation. Our very life comes from Jesus. The Bible says, except you abide in me, you can't produce any fruit. I'm the vine. You're the branches. If you abide in me, you'll produce much fruit. If you don't produce any fruit, you're like a branch that's cut off. You're withered. You die. You get thrown into the fire. Israel itself is set aside as a nation because they didn't bring forth any fruit. They were set aside as a nation, the promise of God, because they rejected their Messiah when they saw him. But that rejection birthed the church of Jesus Christ. One day the church will be complete. Jesus Christ will come and he will take his church away. And then the prophecies that are left for the nation of Israel will be fulfilled. So we only have so much time. We only have so much opportunity to affect our world and be fruitful. That's why Jesus wept over Jerusalem. They're amazed. Master, look, the fig tree, it's, it's cursed. It's, it, 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 the one you curse, it's withered away. It's gone. It's dried up from the roots. It's gone that quick. And Jesus answered said unto them, their amazement at this, have faith in God. Verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever ye desire, wow, underline that, whatsoever you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So, the nation had no faith. Now he's telling his disciples, he's asking for them to have faith when they pray, specifically to pray in faith. What is so amazing to me in the context of this, so many, this, these verses right here are used by so many modern day money changers to get back into the church and to tell you that whatever you want, it's a magic statement. It's a law of attraction. I just have to speak it and God will give it to me. Because of this verse, that God works for me now, and if I name it and claim it, he will give it to me. If I blab it, I can grab it, and I can do it because God said so, and this verse tells me that whatever I desire, I can have. Now, does that jive with the rest of Scripture? Does that jive in context? Absolutely not. But they preach this, this, this God is working for you. Let me tell you something. You're working for God. You're in his field. He's looking for fruit from you. If he doesn't find any, he can pluck you up and take you out of that field any time. In Corinthians, it said many people were losing their lives because of their testimony, and God took them home because they were making a mockery of God. They weren't living their life properly. They were getting drunk at the communion table, and, and sexual sin and all that stuff was going on, and God was taking them out because it's his vineyard. Not yours, not mine. You have to remember that. This is God's church. Doesn't belong to any man, doesn't belong to any domination, doesn't belong to any seminary. It's his vineyard. But so many men in the vineyard, pastors and seminaries, they want to take the vineyard over for themselves. So they really don't want to interpret scripture the way God wrote it. They want to interpret it the way they want to interpret it. And then they want to tell you what your itching ears want to hear. And you say, if I pray anything that I desire, God's got to give it to me. He's beholden. He's my servant. And he's going to give me what I want. False. Does it jive with the rest of scripture? Jesus said this. He taught us how to pray. How did he teach us how to pray? Thy kingdom come, thy will. Does it say Matt's will? Does it say that um, Calvary Chapel's will? Does it say the elders will? I pray it doesn't. I have problems with the elders here too. You know, man, sheesh. Um, does it say the Baptist's will? Does it say the Reformation's will? Does it say the church father's will? No, it says... God's will. Jesus himself said, not my will, but thy will be done. There is power in faith, but faith has to be what? First thing he says is have faith in God. Not faith in faith, faith in God. Not faith in a mantra or, or words, but faith in God. We must apply our prayers according to God's will, and then he will hear our petition. 
First John says this. Let me read it for you. First John 5, 14 says this. This is the confidence. Now, we can have confidence, boldness, openness, or frankness that we can have in God that if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. So if I'm praying anything against his will, is he listening to me? No, what he's saying is, is, and lots of my prayers start out with my will first. Lord, I'm, and he's like, are you done? Are you done with your will? Because when we're done with your will, then we can get to my will. Because I don't care what your will is, you're mine. And you're going to do my will. And I'm going to answer every prayer according to my will, not your will. Whatever you desire according to his will, yes, he will hear you. And if we know that he hears us whatsoever he asks, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. Interesting thing about prayer, and it's always boggled my mind. When we pray, the Bible says God already knows what we're going to say before we say it, correct? He already knows the words before they're formed. Why does God need to hear them? Not only that, why do I have to pray them if he already knows what I'm going to pray and he's so sovereign he's going to do anything anyway, right? Right? But we're commanded in the Bible to pray, to pray always, to pray without ceasing, to pray that we may be accounted worthy to escape all that is coming upon the earth and stand before the Son of Man. Can prayer, here's a question I have for you. You answer this for me. Can prayer, can prayer actually change the future? Can it change something in your life? Can prayer alter a course of your life that wouldn't have altered if you didn't pray. You got to ask yourself that question. Some people say God's so sovereign, you don't need to pray. But the Bible commands us to pray. Here's, here's my belief on it. There is a spiritual realm where you have to ask for permission. God wants to work in your life, and you're going to say, well, God's sovereign. He is sovereign, and he sovereignly gave you free will to pray. And he asks you to pray because when you pray, you're giving him permission to implement his will into your life. That's what you're praying for. And when you pray according to his will and say, implement your will, his will will be done. And anything you ask in that will will be done for you. The same thing goes for the dark side. You've got to give them permission in your life as well. See, God honors human beings. You're made in the image and likeness of God, and you have a will. And God says, if you pray according to my will, not that I need to hear your prayer, and I already know what you're going to say, but when you ask, I want to give. How much more will I give my Holy Spirit to those that ask? So there's something that God wants us to do, even though he's sovereign and knows everything we're going to say before we say it. He wants us to participate. And when we participate, that unleashes heaven on your behalf. Do you believe that? Prayer, how important is it? It's mysterious, but he wants us to pray. And if you pray according to his will, anything that you ask will be given to you. James, now, he was a half-brother of Jesus. He said this, you know why you're not receiving the things you want? Because you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. You want to spend it on your own lust. You want to use prayer as something for yourself. Prayer is not for you. It's aligning you with the heart of God and his will. And that's when he unleashes the blessing that you're looking for. And the blessing that you're looking for, let me tell you something, it's not money. And it's not stuff. It's the very heart of God. It's the things that no one can take away. I've had moments with God in prayer that, that have blown my mind. I've been on my face in tears. I, I, I have communed with the living God. No money on earth could, could buy that. Amen. Just the taste of that. Taste and see, the Bible says, that the Lord is good. But if you want to pray and spend it on your own lust, it's wrong prayer. There's wrong prayer and there's right prayer. Jesus says if you have faith in God, not faith in faith, you have faith in God, and you pray, according to his will, you, you, I'll unleash anything you desire. He's going to go on about prayer. He's going to tie it to forgiveness. Verse 25, and when you stand praying, forgive. You know what else hinders your prayers is, is bitterness and unforgiveness. If you have ought against anybody, if you're coming to church and you're angry at somebody right now, or you got something against somebody else, guess what you can do? You can release that person so you can freely worship God. You can't worship God with bitterness and unforgiveness in your heart. It's not going to happen. It's not an option either. It's a commandment. Forgive. If you can't forgive, you're not worshiping. You're playing games with God. God knows your heart. And God knows if you have any unforgiveness or any bitterness sitting in your heart right now. And guess what that's doing? That's hindering him from working on your behalf. 
How can you not forgive somebody after the big debt that God forgave you? Do you want God to forgive you the way you forgive everybody else? Think about that. Then start forgiving the way God forgave you. And you'll start seeing prayer expand in your life in a way that you've never seen before. Your Father also, which is in heaven, he may forgive you your trespasses, but if you do not forgive, if you're unwilling, neither will your Father, which is in heaven, forgive you forgive your trespasses. So if you're unwilling to forgive, guess what? You get what you put in. You get what you put in. I'm going to pray a pessimistic prayer. You get a pessimistic answer. I'm going to pray with unforgiveness in my heart. Guess what you're going to get? Eh, God doesn't talk back to you. I don't feel forgiven. You know when you know that 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 Christ is inside of you and living in you is when you can turn around when somebody's hurt you and you can love them anyway and you don't know how you're getting the power to do it. You're just doing it and you're like, wow, man, I used to be really ticked off about that back in the day. But it doesn't bother me anymore. I don't know that I've arrived when somebody cuts me off on 33 and I say, God bless you. Bless you. I'll know that I'm there. But I'm working toward it. And when I get and pray and I say, Lord, forgive me for all that nonsense. True forgiveness. Refusing to forgive and bitterness, man, there are mountains that people have in their life, mountains of bitterness that they can't get past. It's not an option. He emphasizes it. Your forgiveness depends on it. The true mark of a believer is the way they forgive because forgiveness and love go hand in hand, don't they? I had a question for you. Who's married here? Okay. How many times have you forgave your husband? We'll start with the women first. Why do you do it? Right. Why do you do it? You could just let go. There's no way you're ever going to help him. Think about it. He's going to continue to do the same stupid stuff over and over again. Why do you do it? Because you love him. I love the galoot. I love the dummy. I just have to forgive him. So forgiveness is tied to love. You don't mind forgiving somebody you love. Men, the same thing goes for your wife. How many times is she going to have to nag you about something before you go, great, you're going to, yes, dear. Why do we do that? Because we love our wives. We're willing to put up with it. Because love covers a multitude of sins. Love covers. Love forgives. Love is inextricably linked to forgiveness. I can tell if I'm really loving my wife how much I'm, I'm, I'm able to forgive. And how much you're not able to forgive is to show much how much you don't love. You know when you're holding that thing, oh, really, or you get angry and you're holding that in? That's not what Christ has done for us. The true mark of a believer is in how they forgive. People have a mountain of hate. In our world today, so much hate. I, I come, you know, I watch TV and it seems like they're stoking the hate on purpose. Media stoking the hate. Man, when, when are we actually going to start to love one another, not based upon the color of our skin, but because on the content of our character? Well, well, when's that going to happen? You know, and it does happen. It happens here every week. It happens here. The true, the true mark of a believer, the true mark of unbelievers is hatred, anger, bitterness, stoking up division, divisiveness, rivalry, purposely doing that, purposely setting up camps and playing people against one another. That's the power and control of this world. Jesus said, we're not like that. That's not how we're going to behave. We're going to love one another. We're going to win the world through love and forgiveness. Now the question is, do you want Jesus to forgive you the way you forgive others? Something we all need to work on. Amen. And they come again to Jerusalem. Verse 27, as he was working to finish a chapter. Everybody okay with that? You sure? Nobody's going to complain afterward. I got it two weeks ago. It's funny, you know, two weeks ago I went 62 minutes and people were like, you went 62 minutes. Then the next week I like, I was right on time, 45 minutes. Now this week I'm going to be over again and people that were mad and skipped last week are going to get two in a row. Maybe they never stops. <laughs> should have came last week because I was really good. <sighs> I forgive you though for the thoughts that you have. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to do that. <sighs> And they come again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking to the temp in the temple, there came to him the chief priests and scribes and elders, and saying to him, By what authority are you doing here? They come again. They never stop. You got to give them credit because they're very persistent in their hatred for Jesus, their satanic 
Satanically inspired hatred never ceases. By what authority do you do these things and who gave you? Two questions. What authority? How are you doing this stuff? And who gave you this authority? So they're hung up on authority. They told them to stop the people from saying, Hosanna, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. You better stop them. And Jesus said the stones would cry out. Turned over the tables in their temple. Stopped all their money. Their money raking scheme. They didn't like that. He's taught with authority and the people are listening. They don't like that. So they want him dead. They don't like the people going after him, and they want to know where he got this authority from. They couldn't deny his power and authority. They had accused him of being in league with Satan prior because they couldn't deny all the miracles that he did. They confront Jesus with the question of who gave you this power? Where did you get it? And in fact, they hated Jesus too. They, Jesus came, and he started to teach them, and they said, where did this man learn the letters? He knew their letters. He knew Hebrew. He wrote the Bible. It's God they're talking to. This is a carpenter from Galilee. They never understood who they were looking at or who they were talking to. That's how he knew the whole Bible. Where did this man learn this stuff? They're jealous of him. Let me tell you something. True authority comes from God. True ministry comes from God. Not from a people. Not from some rabbi or some seminary. It comes straight from God. Where would you get your authority? Where do you get your authority? If you're born again by the Spirit of God... You're an able minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have authority in God. You have authority right now in God to proclaim the good news. Now, you know the people are loving to see Jesus put them in their place. So they come and say, where'd you get this authority? And Jesus doesn't need their approval. He doesn't need to kiss their ring. He doesn't need their seminary. He don't need anybody because he's God. His authority came straight from the Father. Jesus accused them of not being able to receive him because they were looking for approval from each other. Let me read that for you in John chapter 6. I'm sorry, John chapter 5, verse 44. In fact, we'll back up one. I am come in my Father's name. That's where I get my power, and you don't receive me. If another shall come in his own name, speaking of the Antichrist, you guys will love him. How can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? So if Jesus dwells in us and his spirit fills us, our authority doesn't come from men, it comes from God. And the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. The question we must all ask ourselves is, whose approval are we seeking? If you're looking for approval from men, then your authority will come from men. If you're preaching with the authority of a man's institution, you will preach under their authority. I'm not too big on membership. You know why? Because I could make you sign a covenant. It would be a short covenant because I couldn't keep... I went to a church when I was younger. I'm sorry, we're going to go over. Um, (laughs) I went to a church when I was a kid. They had a covenant that you had to sign. You can't dance, you can't smoke, you can't drink, you can't go to the movies, and you can't listen to secular music. And people sign this stuff. I'm like, I'm not signing that. I'll let you in on some occasionally. I hear some music at the gym. It's not Christian. I'm out to church for that. (laughs) See, you can sign a covenant and outwardly try to obey all the rules that you want. You can put all the fig leaves you want around you. The real test is in the fruit that you produce. Not in the covenants that you sign or the papers that you sign or the promises to some institution. You're born again by the spirit of the living God. Your life doesn't belong to a church belongs to God, and that is the church. We're the church when we gather together here. What would it do me to hand you a piece of paper and say, follow this paper? You're following me then. You're not following God. You're an able minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's nothing different between you and me. I stand up here and preach. You could do the same thing. Except if you're a woman, you can't be a pastor in the church. That's in the scripture. Sorry. It's the truth. You want to talk to me afterward because we'll be here another 10 minutes as I tell you the truth. (laughs) And I might aggravate some women in the process, which I don't care, but we get to Corinthians, we'll go over it. She didn't need their approval. When Jesus dwells in us, then we don't need man's approval either. So whose approval are you seeking? The fear of man, the Bible says, is a snare. Whose honor do you seek? Whose word do you regard? And Jesus showed them who he was by many infallible proofs. 
Um, if they had known their own prophecies, believed their own Bible, understand their prophecies, they would have understood who was talking to them. And Jesus cares about one thing, honoring the Father and doing his will. That's where true power comes from. Verse 29, we'll get to 32 here. And Jesus answered and said unto them, where's your power come from? Well, I'll ask, answer your question with a question, which was a common practice back in that day. I will ask you one question and you answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or of men? Answer me. And they reasoned with themselves saying, if we shall say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? But if we shall say of men, they feared the people, for all men counted John that he was a prophet indeed. So he answers their question with a question and says, look, the answer to your question is in my question to you. You'll find the answer there if you answer my question honestly. John the Baptist, where does his authority come from? Did it come from God or did he get his ordaining from man? And the people loved John the Baptist. You got to remember, they flocked to him. They repented. Jesus said there wasn't one greater born of women than John. Nobody else was born greater. And John looked at Jesus and said, I'm not worthy to unlatch his shoe. He looked at Jesus and said, behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He looked and said, I must decrease and he must increase. And then he looked at the Pharisees and said, you brood of vipers. Who warns you to flee from the wrath to come? Don't say to you, you're some child of Abraham like that's going to save you. You're doomed. He called them out on the carpet. One coming after me, man, his winnowing fork is in his hand. He's going to burn, he's going to gather his wheat into the barn and burn the chaff with unquenchable fire. Repent. And he baptized Jesus, and it said, the heavens opened up. Were they there when God spoke out loud and said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm already well pleased? So if they say, yeah, your authority, John, comes from God, then they have to admit that Jesus was from God because John's message was about Jesus. If they say, you're not from God, they feared the people. And the people will turn on them and say, John was a great prophet. You don't know what you're talking about, and they'll attack him. So you know what they say? Even though they know the truth? I don't know. Verse 33. And they answered and said unto Jesus, we don't know. We can't tell. They knew. They knew the truth. But they didn't want to speak the truth. And Jesus answering saith unto them, well, I'm not telling you by what authority I do these things either. So if they can't be honest about John, they're not going to be honest about Jesus. They knew perfectly well who Jesus was and is. And if people won't be honest, guess what? Jesus won't reveal himself to you in any authoritative way in your life. God sees the heart. It says this in Psalm 51, 6. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me no wisdom. So it all starts with truth on the inside. And truth is, they want to kill Jesus, and Jesus knows it already. They don't want him to rule. They want the vineyard. He's going to give them a parable. We'll hit this next week about the vineyard. He gave them prophets. They killed them. They stoned them. He said, they'll honor my son. He sent him my son. They looked at the son and said, mm, that's the heir. Let's take it for ourselves. We want the vineyard. So they refused to face the truth. Many people do the same thing with salvation. I'm a good person. I've done good things. Paul would say, in me dwells no good thing that is in my flesh. Let me tell you something. No amount of religious leaves can cover up for a lack of fruit in your life. Joining a church ain't going to do it. Being a member ain't going to do it. Being born again by the Spirit of God, that will do it. That will do it. There's a big difference between Adam and Jesus. Adam, when he sinned, he looked for leaves to cover himself with. When Jesus came to this earth, he looks for fruit, eternal fruit, fruit that will remain. I think that's something that we all need to take a good look at our own lives and say, Lord, I want to be fruitful. Let's stand. We'll pray. Father God, we lift our hearts to you, Lord. We know you've overheard. We know, Lord, as you were looking for fruit from that nation, and you, you, you handed it to us. You've engrafted us into this vine of faith. And Lord, you're looking for fruit from our lives. So we ask, Lord Jesus, by the power of your spirit, Lord, teach us to love the way you love. Teach us to forgive the way you forgave. And Lord, teach us to pray according to your will so that we could have the things we so desperately desire. Lord, if anybody in this room does not know you, it's your heart. You said you're not willing any should perish, but all should come to repentance and to know you. If anyone in this room does not know you, Lord, we pray that 
you would convict their heart even now and that they would come to you in a real way and make that transaction of faith, Lord, and pray believing that you'll forgive all of their sins and you'll make them a son or a daughter this morning. Lord, we, we lift that to you. We know we're praying according to your will that you came to seek and to save the lost. We pray that for anybody in this room that does not know you, Lord. We also pray for all of us who do know you, Lord. We ask for a filling of your spirit without measure so that we can pray according to your will. And Lord, we look at the world that we live in and we ask that you'd give us an unction in these last days to win as many as we can to your great name and that our lives might speak of our, of, of, of our Savior, of you, Jesus, in ways that no one can deny. So, Lord, we look to you for these things. We lift our lives afresh, our hearts afresh. Fill us, we pray.